record. Okay, Mary, go ahead. Oh, good evening, everyone. Welcome to our special mid-month session of the book club at the center. Tonight, we have a really special presentation by someone whose names I'm certain you'll, you've heard mentioned many times in our fair city, Elizabeth Licata. We are very excited to have Elizabeth with us for what I know will be a really extraordinary evening. However, before I welcome Elizabeth, I'd like to share a little bit about our book club. We began, excuse me, we began in 2011 as a docent initiative, reading the books that were beloved and read by our own Charles E. Birchfield. We then transitioned into reading books written by regional authors, of which there are many, many. We were having that discussion before we all let you join us. In fact, we featured over 60 living authors in our book club over the many years that we've been running it. Um, before I introduce Elizabeth, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Michaela Waros, who will explain a little bit about how this evening will go. Michaela? Hello, everyone. Uh, for anyone who is new to Zoom webinars, um, if you have questions for the author, please use our Q&A section at the bottom of the screen. You also have a chat function to say hi to any participants that you know in the uh, chat or say hi to the author or Mary and I. Uh, we are streaming on Facebook, so anyone seeing this, you can use the comment section there to ask questions. I will be looking at that too. And we are also recording it this evening, but only the panelists are being recorded. Um, but also, if you don't have a chance to stay for this entire evening, uh, you can always ask for a link and we'll send it to you after. So thank you, Michaela. I'd now like to share a little bit about Elizabeth Licato, though I'm sure you know much already. She has been a publisher, a writer, an editor for more than 25 years. She has been instrumental in bringing the wonderful Buffalo Spree Magazine from a faltering semi-literary publication to the vibrant award-winning magazine it is today. She has authored more than one book. In 2006, she wrote the book, Garden Walk Buffalo, a celebration of urban gardens. And then she wrote in 2018, the publication, 100 Things to Do in Buffalo Before You Die. Uh, she has also written for a number of well-known art and garden, gardenery, gardening, having trouble with that word tonight, publications, has written many essays in various anthologies, and is a regular contributor to an internationally read gardening blog called GardenRant.com. Today, she's here to discuss her latest book, Secret Buffalo. I have it right here. It is with great pleasure that I welcome Elizabeth Licata. Elizabeth? Thank you so much, Mary. Thank you so much, Michaela. You guys are great. I see I have to update my LinkedIn um, bio. It's, I've been actually writing for 35 years, as I, which I shouldn't probably even say. So um, yes, Elizabeth Lacana. So I, I think um, Mary having introduced me, I'm gonna go right into my presentation and I'm gonna share my screen. I have a very brief, short, but brief presentation to give you. And then I'm really looking forward to your questions about the book. So here we go. So, Secret Buffalo, 
is actually um, sort of a follow up to the book that Mary mentioned called 100 Things to, to Do in Buffalo Before You Die. And the publisher is Reedy Press. Reedy Press is based in St. Louis, Missouri. They contacted me about writing the 100 Things to Do in Buffalo Before You Die book. And I said yes, because having uh, worked at Spree, been editor of Spree for 20 years, it was something that uh, at that time, I suppose 19 years, it was something that I felt I could easily do. And with Spree being the full-time plus job that it is, easy was important. So I wrote the 100 things to do in Buffalo before you die. And they have 100 things to do in Chicago before you die, 100 things to do in Boston before you die and all that. It's, it's sort of a what we call niche. And at Buffalo Spree, we love niche because Spree is also a niche publication, a city regional magazine. These are what we call niche books. Secret. Then they have another uh, series called Secrets Buffalo, Secret Chicago, Secret St. Louis, and there's also food books. And they contacted me about the Secret Buffalo book. And actually it was something, a much more complex book to, to work on. And it took me a lot more time. And particularly since my deadline was right around when the pandemic hit, so I blew through that deadline, whined about the pandemic, you know, and then I blew through another deadline, but eventually I had to publish the thing. I was really hoping, I had to send in my manuscript and I was really hoping that by then we would all be able to gather that was not the case. However, here we are, and I'm glad that you're here, however you got here and however way we're doing it so I can do this presentation. I really liked the book. It was more work than the first book. I think it contains more interesting information than the first book. It has color pictures, which the first book did not have. And um, it was, it, like I said, it was a lot more work, but fun and difficult because after all, what is a secret? What is a secret anyways? Something that's secret to me may not be secret to you at all. So I am going to read, normally this isn't the kind of book that you read from, you know, like a poetry book or something, but there is my intro gets into this whole question of the definition of secret, which I think is kind of a difficult thing to define. There's a building at 812 Main Street that's emblazoned with the words, keep Buffalo a secret in five foot high letters. It's a highly visible admission that in Buffalo, everything is considered a secret. For decades, Buffalonians have assumed, rightly, that most outsiders know very little about their city except that Buffalo found a way to give America chicken wings despite being buried in snow most of the time. Those assumptions have changed over the past 20 years. Buffalo's amazing natural assets, cultural treasures, architectural riches, and edible delights are being discovered by new residents and visitors alike. It still makes the question of what is well known and lesser known difficult to parse. Some things here, such as the Dnipro Ukrainian Cultural Center, have been part of the daily lives of some Buffalonians for many years, but still are unknown outside of their neighborhoods. There are new additions, such as Oxford Pennant, that all the cool kids know about, but that would be completely unfamiliar to the other 80%. And there are a few items that almost nobody knows about. Those are the real secrets, such as the thwarted Jewish homeland on Grand Island and the lonely Metcalf House remnants in Buffalo State College's Rockwell Hall. Probably not a secret to certain people here. The fact that Buffalo has a huge mural screaming about its secrecy is testimony to the city's sense of humor as well as its pride. The very idea of secrecy is built on shifting sands in Buffalo. The items in this book, regardless of their levels of secrecy, are presented to help readers understand why Buffalonians love their city and why some of them may really wish to keep it a secret sometimes. So that's it. That's the only reading I'm going to do. And we'll go on with my very short presentation. And you'll see right away why something the idea of secrecy is so difficult and why something that you won't think is secret at all, I might've considered worthy of putting in this book. Okay, <laughs> what could possibly be secret about pizza, right? Not secret at all, but the buzz is new. I remember when 
the whole idea of you, you, you automatically dissed Buffalo pizza. You wanted to have the thin crust pizza, the Neapolitan pizza, the cool kid pizza. But recently Buffalo pizza, and not everyone here knows this or maybe even cares about it, has become, is kind of gaining its own fame. Uh, it has its own sorts of things that it's known for. Like for example, as you can see here, the cup and char pepperoni. This is an ideal uh, example of cup and char pepperoni. This is from Picasso's by the way. Very good pizza there. And, and the bit thicker crust and kind of a lot more cheese, maybe a little more tomato sauce. It's the Buffalo style pizza and you'd be amazed that it is not found hardly anywhere else. This is truly a Buffalo secret if you don't know how great Buffalo food is. Cyclorama, not secret. I mean, you can't miss it if you're driving around Edward or in that area, Franklin. However, what was it used for? A lot of people don't know that Cyclorama was actually the very first movie, sort of a movie theater of its time in the 19th century where gigantic, and I do mean gigantic, I am talking about 500 feet long paintings were stretched all along the interior walls of this circular building um, depicting important sort of, uh, hold on, let me just find this for a minute. Yes. important biblical events, religious events, historical events. Um, the cyclorama was constructed in 1888 to display the crucifixion of Christ, which was 360 feet long and 50 feet high. It was on view for two years, it attracted as many as a thousand visitors a day for two years. Now that I would defy almost any art exhibition that's going on right now to get that kind of visitation. Next up, Battle of Gettysburg, which was up for another two years. But by this time, cycloramas had had their day. It was a trend, it was a flash in the pan, but that's why this building was built. It's an innocuous, well, not innocuous from the outside, but I've been inside, I don't know how many of you have, and it's innocuous inside. It's an office building, but that's what it once was. Now, this is not secret. A lot of you have been down to the Erie Basin Marina. You've seen these beautiful flower beds. Probably many of you think quite mistakenly <laughs> that the city of Buffalo would plant and maintain such a thing as this. And that's just not the case. These are the Erie Basin Marina test gardens. They're here for a purpose and it's not just to look pretty. In fact, that's a secondary purpose. The purpose of these gardens is to test new seeds, new varieties of flowers, may all, mainly annual, some perennial. There used to be some rose action, but they took that isn't there anymore. And it's been run by the same guy, Stan Swisher, single-handedly with a few volunteers for 40 years. And what happens here is he plants hundreds, thousands of these annuals in big pots and beds and so on and reports back to, usually it's just, there's only two C companies now, reports back, how, how did they do? Because these are kind of difficult conditions, full, sun, full blazing sun, all summer long, wind and so on. So this is, these are the kind of hard conditions that these, uh, pr these annuals face and how well do they stand up? Do they wilt? How much water do they need? How needy are they? And that's what Stan reports. He grows the seeds, by the way, in greenhouses um, at the uh, Buffalo, at the Erie, let's see, the Botanical Gardens. I had to include this secret because it's something that's understood as being part of our uh, Buffalo Niagara history, but really only incompletely understood and often kind of misunderstood with a lot of mythology connected to it. And this is the Underground Railroad, which is certainly one of the most secret historic movements that we know about. It had to be a secret. If it wasn't a secret, people would be imprisoned, people would be, would be caught, people might die. And we've always thought and thought we knew uh, how that Buffalo was a place where the Underground Railroad had operated, that Niagara Falls was a place where the Underground Railroad had operated. And we have our ideas of places that we think 
were Underground Railroad hiding places. Most of them were not Underground Railroad hiding places, but Buffalo and Niagara Falls were very important and mainly because of just running the network. Uh, if you go to, I highly recommend people go to the Underground Railroad Heritage Center in Niagara Falls, which is built in its old train station. It's lovely and find out how the Underground Railroad really worked. Yes, and then there's some things that I just don't feel are recognized enough. One of them is the amazing public art program that runs throughout our Metro rail system, where you have about 27 different installations in most of the stations, um, not all of the stations. When I first noticed the art, I was uh, a young student at Buffalo State College and this was one of the first artworks I noticed at the Utica station. And I was sitting there and thinking, what is that? Why is that there? I have no idea. Years later, I learned about this. And it, it's just many people, I mean, I, I don't think, I think the, the I, I know that the Metro rail is used. It's not as underused as people think, but a lot of people go through the Metro rail and they don't see these amazing sculptures. And in my book, I talk about who curate, how they were curated, who the artists were, and so on. Now, this is still secret for many, but I think more and more people are beginning to discover this, which is a good thing because I'm a little concerned about its longevity. This is the Prophet Isaiah Second Coming House. Now, it was made by Isaiah Henry Robertson, a contractor living in Niagara Falls, and he was visited by a divine prophecy sometime in the early 2000s. God instructed him that come the end of the world in 2014, oops, all of humanity would come flying by Robertson's house and the house must become a beacon of salvation. After flying by the house and choosing salvation or not, the multitudes would proceed to Goat Island near Niagara Falls, where they would proceed on their upwards or downwards path. If it was downwards, they would just be thrown into a pit at the base of the falls. Uh, I discovered this driving around Niagara Falls. My sister lives up there. Otherwise, I never would have been driving around this neighborhood. It's not a terrific neighborhood. It's on Ontario Street. And if you're just driving along this very innocuous neighborhood, kind of drab, and you see this, it's just astounding. It, it's so hard to, to kind of describe the, the, the shock of this huge colorful display, which he kept up for years, uh, added to it, touched it up. He died last year. So I don't know what's gonna become of this property. And if those of you who are interested in seeing it, I urge you to visit it because who knows what might happen. I don't think anyone's gonna be developing this for like a fancy mixed use uh, apartment building or anything, not, not in this area of Niagara Falls. So we can hope that it'll be here for a while. Best kept garden secret. Now, of course, we're, uh, we know that Garden Walk Buffalo is happening this year. It's one of the events that is going on, will be in person, but Garden Walk Buffalo is as, fa as fabulous as it is. Uh, leaves out all the gardens that are outside of Buffalo. And people just think if they've missed Garden Walk Buffalo, they've missed everything. But there's also an open garden program that I know must be a secret because not too many people participate in it. And so throughout Thursdays and Fridays in July, you can visit gardens in where this is, which is sort of, I would say, Hamburg or North Boston around there, middle of nowhere, believe me. Or you can go to Lock, or you can go to Gardens in Lockport, in Amherst, in Lancaster, uh, all over the area, in, in Williamsville. And this is a fabulous garden that is kept by Michael and Kathy Shadrach, who are well-known garden authorities. They've written books on uh, hostas. Kathy is uh, the leader of a, a iris group and a daylily group. They're experts on just about everything gardening, and very few people have seen this gorgeous garden that the other interesting thing about it is that it, their house is built over a creek 
and uh, Mike calls it Frank Lloyd wrong. And it, so you've got this spectacular location with the creek running below it and all these gardens, and this is just only a tiny bit. And then you have Mike and Kathy, and Mike is fabulous. He's from England, he used to be a London Bobby. And you can go see this garden for free in July on Thursdays and Fridays. This is a true secret. Uh, the Beth Jacobs Cemetery. It is a cemetery for Buffalo's first Jewish congregation. Uh, it uh, stopped being used actively as a cemetery sometime, I believe, in the 80s. And then it sort of, it's, it's on the east side and it sort of fell into decay. Uh, I went, I saw it on a tour that I was taking of some of the uh, churches that are also very endangered in that part of Buffalo. Uh, there was a Boy Scout program that uh, tried to sort of set the cemetery straight and they did some work, but they still need a lot of volunteerism and a lot of help to sort of get this back to what it should be because it's a very important part of Buffalo's history. There was a huge Jewish community, community on the east side. One of the last remaining um, temples that was there, of course, was, was torn down recently. So this is... Um, a kind of secret and kind of sad remnant of Buffalo's past. This is a very interesting place. I don't know how many of you recognize this or how many of you could ever have been inside it, but it's, I wanna get this right, the Canisius Auditorium. It's not really used as the Canisius Auditorium anymore because it's too small. But back in the eighties, um, some of you may be aware that uh, Sonny and Cher, or not Sonny and Cher, Cher and Greg Allman came to Buffalo because Greg Allman was undergoing rehab here. They stayed on Agus's circle near Madai. A lot of people knew they were here, but not too much was, you know, it wasn't really publicized that much, but people knew. And one of the people that knew was one of the Canisius students who wrote to Greg Allman expressing his admiration for his music and what a wonderful musician he, he was and so on, and indicated that he'd really love to see him perform. And Allman really wanted to perform. He hadn't performed for a long time. He's a musician and that's what musicians do. So he came and gave a concert just for these students in this auditorium. And only the students were invited to it. And it's this wonderful moment for those students. And uh, Cher and their son, Elijah Blue, sat there on the stage as he performed. This is bizarre, just simply bizarre. There's no other word. This is the would-be Jewish homeland that was supposed to, supposed to uh, take place on Grand Island. Uh, in 1824, an early American Zionist named Mordecai Manuel Noah arranged the purchase of one fifth of Grand Island about 12 miles north of Buffalo. And I'm sure this wouldn't have been a difficult purchase to make in those times. I mean, nothing was settled then. He traveled to Buffalo, he, he purchased it he didn't even live here. He was living in New York. He purchased it from there. And his friend financed it for him. He traveled to Buffalo, dedicated the land, called it Ararat, as you see. Uh, the dedication took place in St. Paul's Episcopal Cathedral because there weren't enough boats to take people over to Grand Island. They did not have the bridges then um, or cars or anything. So that happened, however, and he declared himself the governor and judge of Israel. However, he had not told any of the Jewish people whose homeland this was to be that the homeland was there for him, for them. And uh, it sort of nothing became of it because he didn't notify anyone. There's also a stone that was intended to mark the site that was never brought over there, but that you can find in the history museum. Uh, this, this sign was put up later just to indicate that this happened or didn't happen. And I, I couldn't do a secret book or any book about Buffalo without having food in it, which is something I will tell you that Reedy Press wasn't really interested in. 
Uh, they didn't really get why I wanted to have food or recipes. And I'm like, people in Buffalo care about food. So I wanted to talk about some of the Buffalo foods that people don't talk about as much. And like uh, fried bologna sandwiches, like stuffed banana peppers. So some of the more iconic Buffalo foods that aren't chicken wings that aren't, although I do talk about beef on wick because I think beef on wick often takes second place to chicken wings and really shouldn't. And chili dogs and the special sauce that goes on those dogs and uh, red for red hot, red hot sauce rather. And I give the recipe for the banana peppers and the red hot sauce. And of course I'm, I'm very much about gardening and I, I, I imagine that, how can I not mention some of the glorious natural beauty of Buffalo, which I do and, and its environs. And so one of the things I talk about, and I also talk about a lot of parks that I think are lesser known, but this, uh, this sunflower, the, the sunflowers of Sanborn, um, where you can go and there's this huge field of nothing but sunflowers and you can wander through it and take selfies. And, and I felt that nobody who thinks of Buffalo thinks of things like this. They don't think of flowers. They think about snow. So I wanted to show some pictures of things that are included in the book. And I wondered if some of our listeners might actually know what these things are. And I'm going to ask you to, how should it be, Michaela? Can they answer in chat? Should, should they, how should they yeah, do it? Use, use the chat section to, to answer. OK, so tell. And um, the person who gets the most right will get a free book. So there's this. And you can tell me if, if there's any answers, um, Michaela. You don't, you don't tell me what they are. Do we have any answers for this? Yes, there's one from Jean um, Dinpro, D-N-I-P-R-O. That's right. Okay, that's good. This. Oh, I think I know what that is. <laughs> yeah, but I don't think you can enter. No. Too bad I knew the first one. <laughs> uh, Marie says anchor bar. Nope. Maureen says Frank and Teresa's anchor bar. No. Okay. No. <laughs> Still not anchor bar. <laughs> nope. What's different about this bar? That's the clue. But then you have to know that there's a bar like this in Western New York. And, and keep in mind, I'm all about the Western New York. It's a lot of the stuff I have in the book is not necessarily. Jasira says stand up bar. I mean, it's not really called that. Mm -hmm. Catherine says President's Bar. She means Founding Fathers, but no. Yeah. Uh, okay. Leslie says no stools, X <laughs> question mark. <laughs> it's, it's wall and wines in, um, in East Aurora. We'll go on to the next one. You guys can't answer. I have two if I could answer. Jean says the mansion. No. Maureen says Frank Lloyd Wright House. No. Alan says 20th Century Club. No. <laughs> Marie says Roycroft. Oh dear. No. Uh, Marie, uh, Marion says at Buff State Rockwell Hall. I'll give it. It's the, yeah. it's the Metcalf House remains. And this is a great secret because this is, um, there, this was a mansion on, on North Street that was torn down and some of it and several rooms were saved including the dining room, which you see here the library, which you see behind it. Lovely picture, by the way, by our, one of our spree photographers, um, Stephen Gabris, who also took 
uh, the picture of Kanisha's um, auditorium I showed before. Uh, and then the staircase from the house is in the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. And this is a treasure that I have to imagine hardly anyone knows about and that hardly anyone ever goes in. I think uh, Scott from the Birchfield told me that you guys used to have meetings there once in a while. We did. We Might be before your time, Michaela. Yeah, we yeah. had staff meetings. Yeah. Okay, so so all right, I'm going to be um, very nice and give away those two books, and I'm going to count on you two nice ladies to um, sure. distribute those books to the proper recipients for me. Thanks a lot. I'm actually this is it yeah, for me. Good. I'm a. Uh, do I have more? No, it looks not. <laughs> so uh, I'm happy to take questions. All right. Do you want to stop sharing your screen? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, I just like, I love that picture. It's so, such a nice room. Uh, we do have a question from Maureen. Um, and I was going to save this for the end, but if anyone else has Q&A questions, please uh, use that so you can ask questions to Elizabeth. But Maureen's question is, will, your, will the book be available in independent bookstores? She is thinking specifically in Arizona where she is located. No, she would have to buy it. Um, she could buy it directly from Reedy Press online. I, I kind of like to recommend that rather than Amazon, but you could certainly, you know, I mean, I have to say, since she does live out of town and I know you can buy it through Amazon, obviously, but um, it's, it's, a, it's available in independent bookstores, but only in Buffalo. <laughs> I mean, if independent bookstores elsewhere wanted to order it, That's then it right. would be available there. This is a good time to mention our friends Talking Leaves and yes. the other independent bookstores, as well as Thin Ice that carries the book, makes a lot yeah. of book. <laughs> um, and I have had uh, Vidlers actually sells this. Um, my and, and they sold my other book, 100 Things to Do in Buffalo Before You Die. And actually Lloyd Taco was selling 100 Things because they were mentioned in it. And I, the other place that was selling 100 Things was um, the Penn Dixie in Hamburg was because they were in it. Right. And it's actually one of the only places uh, in the 100 Things book where I've never been. You can go and get and just take fossils, you know, and, and scrape fossils off the ground and take them home with you. And that just hasn't been seductive enough for me to go there yet. I don't know if it's available. I, I, I don't think it's going to be available. Birch, I, the Birchfield gift store is kind of uh, specialized. I just put in the chat the link to your book from Reedy Press. So okay. you can go directly to there if you want to buy the book. Um, Let's see, Katrina. Hi, Katrina. Uh, for people new to Buffalo, do you have a recommendation for the first secret Buffalo site they should visit? That's a good question. Good question. People new to Buffalo. And Katrina is new to Buffalo, so. You know what I think is, is really, um, it's in here and it's not a secret to a lot of people, but if you're new to Buffalo, you must take a tour of City Hall. Yes. Most places, you know, I, I might not recommend taking a tour of their city hall. The Buffalo City Hall is totally different. It's covered with art inside and out, top to bottom, everywhere. Everything is a story. Everything has metaphors and history and meaning and lessons and philosophy. And it's just incredible. And then at the very end of it, you get to go to the top and you can see almost all of Buffalo Niagara from the roof and it's beautiful. So if she's new, I think she should take that tour. I think it's free. Now, I don't know what the whole pandemic uh, situation is with the city hall tours, but they generally are free at noon every weekday. That's what I would suggest. And wonderful dogs there. <laughs> Really what? wonderful, wonderful yes, they, know, they know everything. And, but even on that tour, it's impossible for them to tell you everything that there is to know. 
Uh, let's see, Mary Ann has, uh, she says a very basic question. How did you find all of these secret places? Well, keep in mind that I've been editor of Spree for 20 years. So we've actually done issues of Spree where we call, uh, one of them that I did was um, the scandal issue. And that had a lot of obscure stuff in it. Uh, things are 52 things that everyone Buffalonian should do. Uh, that was really more useful for the 100 things book. Uh, but we've done um, things that you didn't know about the Buffalo. We, we're always looking for that kind of stuff in Spree. So I had that. And then um, I had some other, I had other books that were useful references for me. Uh, there's, it just, you know, it, I did a lot of uh, paging through other books. A lot of things were just, I just sort of thinking, thinking about, you know, the kinds of uh, stories that we had written for 20 years and, and which of them might be lesser known or not known. And a lot of this, like I was saying, I stumbled on myself. One of the things in the book is the J.N. Adams um, Hospital, uh, which uh, in Perry's, it, it's, I don't know, about an hour south of here. And uh, I was just, it's in the middle of the woods. It's just gigantic complex. It's beautiful. It's decaying. Uh, it was built by the mayor of Buffalo to be used as a tubercular hospital. Then it was used as a place for developmentally disabled people for quite some time. And then it was just abandoned and it's sitting there. And it is astounding. And I just happened to drive by it. And the same thing for the you know, the prophet Isaiah second coming house. I just happened to drive by it. But a lot of this, and, and the Underground Railroad is something that um, we've written about in Spree. We, we did a very good article about it. So sort of being immersed in Buffalo for like almost my, you know, 20 years of my working career. So Jasira has a question. She says, uh, she said, I noticed that you took a lot of photographs. Is that yet another one of the things that you like to do? Well, I had to, you have to supply all your own photographs and every single item had to have two photographs. However, I was very lucky again. Um, my uh, two of my spree photographers, Casey Kratt had been taking photographs for spree since let's see, 2006. And I asked him, I said, would it be okay if I used, and th that copyright goes back to him. So I was not using Buffalo spree property. Uh, and I asked him if I could use some of his, as many photographs as I needed. And he said, yes. So I was lucky, but a lot of them I took myself. And I actually do enjoy taking photographs. Although I'm not a great photographer. I don't even have an SLR camera. I, I, use, my, I, I use my iPhone, so. So I'm not a real photographer. Uh, so Jane wants to know, that knowing that you're from Lockport, did you find any secrets about Lockport? The cave, except it's the the man the man-made cave, the the water race one that was used for power. That now you can take boat rides up and down. Um, no one knows where the real Lockport cave is, and I really did want to include. I mention it, but I want no one. There's been people have searched for it. They can't find it. But uh, the main Lockport thing was, was, I think that's the only, might be the only Lockport thing. There is an Underground Railroad site in Lockport at the, uh, at the YW. But I think that was my only Lockport one. Because there was great things in Lockport, but I didn't think there was a secret. You know, the canal, the locks, Keenan Center, um, some decent bars, I don't know. Niagara Hotel, could I say that was a secret? I don't know. So let's see, Leslie says, are you always on the lookout for more secret sites? Uh, do lots of people contact you to tell you about places they think you should know about that you don't already? Well, that hasn't happened yet, but the book is really just out. So, you know, I don't know if I'm renowned for like a person who writes about secrets. I will tell you that a lot of people email me as editor of Buffalo Spree to tell me about things that I should write about quite often. 
and a lot of the time I take those uh, I take those suggestions up. Those are really valuable suggestions, and I'm I'm happy to get them. And you you can put my email up if you want. Will do. Uh, Marianne asks, are there any secret places about Forest Lawn? Forest Lawn, I had in my hundred things. I mean, there's a lot of, what I would say about Forest Lawn is there's a lot of interesting stories about the people. Um, I, but I didn't really think of including any of the, the, the stories of Forest Lawn in, in the book. Although I'm thinking that quite legitimately, I'm sure that any one of those stories, the lesser known ones, I'm not talking about Red Jacket's tomb or anything, but, but someone who really is lesser known, but is fascinating could be a secret. So that's, that's something that I might've omitted and, and probably ought to have included. All right, are there any other questions in the, for the Q&A? If not, then I want to sincerely thank you, Elizabeth. I love the book. I'm encouraging everyone to buy the book. I think I may have already mentioned it or perhaps I didn't. I had to buy a second copy because my daughter-in-law stole the first copy and has already done a number of explorations in the book and really loves it. And I borrowed it again this evening and she said, I need to get that back, please return it. So um, it's just a great book, please buy it and consider buying it at our local bookstores or at the NICE. We would really love to see Elizabeth write another book. And so we really congratulate you on this great, really a great um, unearthing of the secrets in Buffalo. So you've been fun to have tonight. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot, and Mary. When those people email you and tell you that they wrote a book, make sure you forward their emails on to me because we're always looking for authors uh, that we could feature in our book club. So thank you so much. And please join us on June 3rd, Thursday, June 3rd, when we're having back by popular demand, Brandon Stickney, who wrote the book, Five People You'll Meet in Prison. It's a true life story, harrowing story about his having to survive two years. I and have that book. He's a really interesting character. Join us. And June 3rd and you'll get to no, he's it. mad at me because we haven't written about it in Spree yet. I don't dare face him. Um, he's another Lockport person, right? Yes. Yes, he is. Uh, so he was coming back by popular demand. And it's. I thought the book was really fascinating. And so I hope you'll all be there. And uh, thank you so much for coming. Thank you, Michaela, for helping facilitate tonight's book club. And Absolutely. Soon. Bye, everybody.